One of the things that I'm still coming to terms with is that I understand that the, the police were going to be very discomforted by the fact that myself and other inmates were talking about the conditions under which we were being held. I understood that. And I was expecting that even in their embarrassment about mm -hmm. it, it will move the humanity in them to want to have a conversation about it and deal with that. What I didn't anticipate, even in terms of all the brutality I'm aware of, that their reaction to this would be violence. Then I know that, you know, for when people are weak-minded, that their response to a, even a genuine conversation is to use force. That's fair. On Saturday, which is, so the first day, perhaps on the Friday, they were still quite tentative about, is this really going to happen? To see it hold, you know, those inmates that their families brought food to them, returned the food away, said that, no, we are not having any food or anything like that. To see it hold on the Friday, I think, gravely surprised them. So on Saturday, that's when they first started, they took one of the inmates out who they sent to in Sawam. You know, we're threatening right. the other people, we're going to disperse you and things mm -hmm. like that. So I was lying down reading, and that's what I spend most of my time in cell. I tend to wake up very early. Most people wake up around 12. Um, I wake up at 5 a.m. and start reading. So most people. So I was reading. Listen, I, uh, incidentally, in the police station, that's a, there's a TV that serves the police officers. If you come close to the cell gates, you can see it. So I was watching Key Point uh, that was going on here in, mm -hmm. in the morning. And so then, when they were in break, at some time, I went back and relaxed, started reading. And then, about six, roughly six to eight, I saw eight later, but I think six entered the cell, heavily armed, and then started shouting at everybody, go back. So they pushed everybody into a corner, right? And then they asked me to step out, so I isolated me. And so I stepped out of the cell, and I came, to, I came outside. Then the, one of them asked me, where are you, all your things? And so I said, I asked them, what's happening? Why are you taking them? Then he repeated, where are all your things? I said, I want to know what's happening. I don't know what happened next. One of them had my neck in a lock. The other one was forcibly trying to put a lock on me. The other one was stepping on my, on my feet with their boots. And then before I realized, punches were all over my feet. In, this is within coming out of the cell and behind the police counter. There was no conversation at any point. We want to move your cell, go somewhere. So I, we anticipated that was going to happen. In fact, when the first person was being moved out in the morning to Insawam, the cell got together and started clapping for him. Mm. The cell started singing gospel songs when the person left. Right. So we anticipated this was going to happen. So when they came, why, why are you moving me? Is a question. Or why are you going... How many, how many police officers were involved in this? Now, there were, there were, I know that there were, there were eight of them who, were, who held me and started punching down on me mm. in that moment. But there were more as well because they had two separate vehicles as they were being transported to the other place. For just so was, you? For just me. So there were, there were several individuals. Now, think about it. This is not the first time I've been removed from the cells. I've, so many times I've been asked to come out. At no point, in fact, every time that somebody comes to the counter, tells the counter CEO, they tell me, they open up, I come out. At no point have they come, unlocked it, and come in there with force. In fact, they wanted the image to see the brutality of that encounter, I think, to be able to put the fear, the, the fear of God in them. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was deeply surprising to see that happen. I couldn't for the life of me understand. And this, all of this was supervised by the individual, the two IC mm -hmm. of the Accra nice. Regional Command. He was standing there. I see. Shout, and as this was going... He was shouting profanities at me throughout the incident. And why the, so the, 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 the process of doing that, and the intention obviously was to beat me up and do all of that. All of that happened. And they took, so then they, they ushered me out. I was, in, I was in a boxes and I was in a, a white top that I was wearing. That's all I had. There was no slippers, there was nothing. I was just bundled and thrown into a vehicle. I had no idea where I was being taken to. I had nothing. In fact, I didn't realize I was bleeding so much. To later on, halfway into the, into the journey, mm. you know? And in that moment, I kept asking myself, like, what to do? Because I was extremely agitated from what had happened to me. Right. I, I just kept wondering, like, what do I do? And, and, and even in my confusion, back? I didn't know where I was being sent to. Right. But I was still wondering, like, I was still, I was still processing it. 
throughout. And I knew that we were driving off and off. I had no idea where we were being taken to. Eventually, we ended up at uh, Dansuman. When we got there, I, complete, I was completely bleeding into, into the weather. You were thing. drenched in your I was drenched in it, you know. In fact, uh, I know, I could, I could feel that, that this hand, there was a problem because I couldn't move it as right. much, you know. And the, it was, the blood was still coming, even as we were sitting there. So when they came to there, they spoke to the officers. They were going to throw me into the cell. In fact, they put me in the cell in there, and I was in there for a while. And then they, they, they came back. Because I had asked, for, I'd asked the commanding officer there that I wanted a broom, because it was extremely dirty, if I can get a broom to sweep. So he, he brought somebody that the person should sweep the cell. And I told the person, no, I'd rather do it myself, because I don't want to burden anybody. So I started it, and then they... They asked me to come out of the cell and they brought me to come and sit down again. So as I was sitting there, then the, the, the two I see who are supervising this starts again with their insults, right? So one of them went to one of the other commanders, I think it was one Mr. Nafiu, I can't be sure, then mentioned that let us at least take him to the hospital because he's bleeding. So that's what they decided in that moment. Yeah. I was surprised that they even they did that because right. I know that the instinct was to avoid and that perhaps they themselves were acting in a manner which they were hoping that physical scars would not show. Mm. So the bleeding kind of disconcerted them a bit. Police explanation for what happened was that she sustained injuries in transit. I don't know how. But I don't know what that means, to be honest. And in fact, I've, I've reserved a lot of comments about that because mm. for me, there's so many things that I'm still trying to make sense of. Would you consider that an honest representation of what happened to you? That what? You sustained injuries. But how? In the air? I, I don't know how. But I mean, I know that the statement is deliberately crafted in a way, using passive or whatever language as if injuries descended upon you as in the way in which mana descends upon a person. But I'm telling you what happened. Mm -hmm. That they did this. I know that in that moment when I was bleeding, that it confused them a bit. Because I was surprised that they, they themselves had a conversation to take me to the hospital, mm -hmm. which saw to it that I was treated, bandaged, tetanus was given to me in those moments uh, before sent back to the cell. In fact, since I've been out and they released this statement, right. we, I, I sent someone to, this is called, I think it's called the Opokuwari Hospital in Dansuman, to go for, for, the, for the medical report that the, the attending physician did. Mm -hmm. And the physician said that he had received calls threatening him from the police and that he was afraid to release the, the medical statement. I see. And that the police had told him that if I want it, I should come and see them and they will come with me to come for the statement. Have you seen your medical reports? No, I haven't. But what we had a report of is that the blood stain shed that they wanted to take away from me and I resisted, that we eventually passed that out to persons who had come subsequently. That incidentally, I don't know who took the picture of when I was being returned back but some people who, because some people, I saw some people had lined up on the street, took a picture of the incident. And that's how that picture even came into the public domain. Hmm. So I'm sure they were surprised by the picture camera, which allowed them to fess up. And in fact, it's the first time I'm seeing the police admit that an inmate sustained injuries, uh, in, which is at their hands. Yeah, while you were being transferred <laughs> from one station uh, to the other. They didn't say they caused the injuries ah. in that statement. So uh, perhaps in, in the future, we'll get to the bottom of this. But, but this, is, ahead. this is a conversation that... I, I think that we are, we are clear in our minds that if we want young people not to lose faith in this democracy, we can't sweep this under the carpet. Mm. This happened last year. We are in court still suing them over it. But this conversation merits a national conversation. And we are demanding and we're going to petition majority in parliament right. to take this issue up. Because we can't allow this when, to when go do you, again. When do you plan to do that? We, within the course of next week. Within the course of next week. But speaking of democracy... Listen, we've said a lot of things that are wrong with our country at the moment. Mm. Is there hope for our democracy to serve us? You know, one of the things that... Um, um, one of the things I was reading a lot, I really enjoy philosophy. And one of them, Edmund Burke, said something which is that a state that lacks the means to change, lacks the means for its own conservation. To sustain our democracy, mm. we ought to be committed to the process of en enhancing it, of changing ways that do not align with that democratic culture. Uh, Professor Kwesi Prempe talks about that. We are trying to build a democracy without Democrats. It can't happen. You know, the, it's almost as if you're, you're a person living with schizophrenia. That we are, we are professing that we want to be a democracy, but our conduct and our actions do not reflect it. 
We must reconcile that. And I think the biggest thing that would ensure that the democracy sustains itself is the people's belief in it. And the people seeing that it can, in fact, answer our most dying questions. Our questions around poverty, our questions around um, health care, around the environment. Democracy must answer those questions for those people in order to, for them to believe in that. We believe that all that we have done, we have done more to sustain our democracy than anything that is, mm. even if they don't give us the credit for. Right. Because every time young people come out for a protest, they say to us that I was so angry when I was coming to that protest. But when I left, I felt that we had done something. Mm. It's a cathartic experience to, to show up for a protest, to be able to release that pent-up anger. We cannot allow it to be redirected. And if they don't understand the work we are doing to sustain our democracy, we are aware of what it takes and what we are doing in the process. Oliver, is this all worth it? Is it worth the pain you go through? Do you think that crisis death was worth it? There's so, there's so much uh, sin that continues to happen many years after Christ died. But I don't think, I, I don't doubt for a fact or a second the value of that sacrifice. And I don't think that any society has changed without that process of sacrifice. Um, I'm not counting the cost to myself. Those are individual costs. We're not going to count that. But we will always be reminded of the promise, what it would mean for others, what's the benefit they are going to derive. It's absolutely worth it. I, mm. the, the idea that Ghana is not worth dying for, I think it's absolutely ri ridiculous. We are all worth it. We are all worth living a different and a better life. And if this is the path towards it, we must take it. I believe in that sincerity. And so that's why I don't measure my advocacy in terms of elections or party or who is that. Because Ghanaians don't measure what's happening to them in terms of every four-year term. We are living that reality every day. And so we, I, I'm completely disabused about what the politics does or who is voting for who. I just know that this is not where I want this country to be. Mm. This is what every other Ghanaian tells me. And every Ghanaian other tells me that we want to be doing what we are doing, right. but we are afraid of. Hopefully we break that pattern of fear mm. before it's too late.